this man, chapter 1, verse 18. Someone well said years ago, the test of a good soldier is how he fights when he's tired. And I thank all of you for soldiering on. I know you're tired in a number of ways. Uh, but nonetheless, here you are, ready to worship God and a study of his word with fellow saints. And... Uh, ready to move forward with what God has for us here in his word to be more pleasing to him and serve one another. And so I thank you for your good example in soldiering on in spite of all the circumstances that are out there. Uh, I'm going to ask Eddie to lead us in word prayer that we get into this text. Eddie, would you please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Let's go before God's throne together. Our Father, as we come before your throne, we recognize you as the, as the Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the, the living God, the one who has created this world and all that is in it, the one who grants life simply by the power of the Lord. Father, we come before you now at this time, bringing our petitions and our requests. We ask that you would be with those of our number that are sick, or with a number of our brothers and sisters that are struggling with very forms of illness. We know that you have the answers for all of those things. We ask that you not only would be with their physical health, but that you would also be with their spiritual and emotional health, and their caregivers and their family. And every one of us, Father, help us to recognize by faith that you are in control of all things. We ask, Father, in this difficult time of challenges that we face with the illnesses that are striking across the country, with the, the various divisions of people who are not sure how to handle or to deal with these things, we ask that you would strengthen us, bring us closer together with one another, help us to find a way to be unified in our service and the declaration of your glory. We ask now that you'll be with us through this time of study, the class we have here, the class downstairs, that as we examine your word, that we would find the wisdom that would make us to be strong and courageous in our service to you. In Christ's name, we offer our prayer. Amen. Matthew 1 18. We Verse 18 of Matthew 1. Good to see you all tonight. We're talking about the miraculous conception. The birth of Jesus was not super, supernatural, it was a normal process. But the conception was by the Holy Spirit. And uh, so that's that's mentioned here in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be the child by the Holy Spirit. An amazing truth stated very succinctly by the Holy Spirit. I would want to expound. I would want to elaborate on that a great deal. But... It's just another example, brothers and sisters, of the fact that God doesn't find it necessary to multiply words in order to give strength. When God states the truth one time, there's not enough power in the heavens or on the earth to make it otherwise. God says, Mary conceived in her womb by the Holy Spirit. Of course, that was something that was prophesied in the book of Isaiah. And he's going to uh, mention that in just a moment here. Uh, verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her plan to send her away secretly. So, a betrothal. What do you know about a betrothal uh, in these times? What, how serious was a betrothal? It, it was like marriage, wasn't it? Marriage. It was very serious. Uh, it typically would last about a year. 
It was an arranged marriage, unless the husband to be was older, maybe his parents weren't alive. Typically, the parents would meet with one another. The uh, parents of the husband to be would give a dowry to the wife's parents and, of course, a reward to her. That's the way it was to cover the loss of this person in your family and all the help that she's been because now she's going to help the husband's family and probably his father's family. And uh, so you'd have that dowry that would be given. And then it would be typically about a year. And there's no dating. There's no courtship. Just an agreement. And it's a binding agreement. And uh, very, very serious. And so with, within that time period of waiting, if there was unfaithfulness or infidelity, that was a capital offense under the Old Testament. Capital offense, Deuteronomy 22. Well, here, here's a situation where Joseph somehow has learned she's with the child. And in his mind, she's committed what? Yeah, sexual immorality. She's guilty of sexual immorality. What a disgrace. What a shameful thing. Uh, you can only imagine how Joseph, you know, was conflicted during this time. But whose shame is he more concerned about? Hers. Hers. You know, in just a brief statement again, God says, this is the character of this man. Righteous. Merciful. Says a lot. One aspect of righteousness, very important aspect, is mercy. The righteous man, he's merciful. He's concerned about her shame, even though she's committed in his mind a sin. So he says, I, I, I'm going to put her away, but I'm not going to drag her before a civil magistrate, a Jewish civil judge. Instead, I'm going to do it privately. Probably you'd have two or three witnesses, and that's the way it would be done. So while he's pondering that, that's his decision. What happens? You know, God, there's never been a midnight so dark God couldn't see your recess of the mind. God couldn't hear your thought. So what's God know what's going on in his mind? This is his decision. Knowing that, how does God intervene? That's right, sister. He sends an angel. And in a dream, um, tells Joseph to not be fearful of taking her as his wife, because that which is in her womb is conceived by the Holy Spirit. This is of God. This is all part of God's plan. What prophecy said that this would happen? What prophet? What prophecy? 700 plus years before. Isaiah. Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. In the Septuagint, the first Greek translation of the Hebrew text, it reads virgin. It doesn't say young woman. It reads virgin. There's some dispute as whether or not the Hebrew is this or that, but the Septuagint says virgin. And, and of course, what does Matthew say? Virgin, that seals the deal. So Matthew says that definitely this is what happened. The only person in history that was born from a virgin. So Mary is the biological mother, but Joseph is not the biological father, legal father. But the lineage can be traced from Joseph, and I believe from Mary as well in Luke's account in chapter 3. So both sides. Uh, yes, brother. To me, looking at this from Joseph's viewpoint, Luke, Luke really records it from Mary's viewpoint. But to look at so. it from Joseph's viewpoint, you know, first of all, she had been gone for three months and she comes back pregnant. That's how, you know, and thought, well, while she was gone visiting with Elizabeth, that's when she committed this adultery. But, but then to have this angel come and talk to him and then to tell him that, mm -hmm. can you imagine your? betrothed, and you're told she's pregnant, but she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah. And, and, yeah. You know, that what, that, what that does to his view of looking at Mary at that point, yes. 
that's uh, yeah. to me that's really beyond imagination. Yeah, I can I, I can only imagine how I would respond to that. But he shows great faith, doesn't he, in accepting that, and so does Mary. Be it done unto me, as uh, the Lord has said. So they both show great faith here. God was, uh, of course, extremely wise in selecting these two to be the parents of his, his son. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the uh, emphasis upon the kind of man that God stresses that uh, Joseph was here. Uh, so that was in verse 20 and 21, um, the intervention there. And then verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. As Isaiah 7, verse 14, as we've divided that text. Um, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So uh, in, in saying this, this was to fulfill. How many times are you going to see that kind of language in the Gospel of Matthew? which clearly shows us this was written first to a Jewish audience. Any idea of how many times you're going to see to fulfill, to fulfill? Maybe some 42 times. And uh, so that tells you, of course, the ones that can really appreciate that are the Jews, written first to a Jewish audience. And I, that's why, I, I, of all the Gospels, I... I like Matthew because it takes us back to the Old Testament so much and helps us see the whole complete picture, the plan of God, uh, just lived out. And so, uh, but many, many times we'll see that, that stated. Uh, go to John 5, if you would please. I just want to, uh, this is a passage I often go to in evangelism and uh, account for the same reason. We have the scriptures as our witness. Um, and John, in chapter 5, Jesus will basically put before us the primary witnesses we had that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus said in verse 31 of John 5, uh, If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Look at this, verse 33. You sent to John. He has testified to the truth. So you have John's witness. To deny Jesus as the Christ, you'd have to throw out John as a reliable witness. And then verse 36, just read it to yourself. What witness do you have according to verse 36 that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Anybody, what do you have? Divine works. You have the works. You have the miracles. You have the supernatural things that he did. That's pretty powerful. Uh, and then in verse 37, the Father, you've got the Father. In verse 39, what do you have? What's the witness in verse 39? The scriptures. the scriptures. So he says, you search the scriptures, of course, be the Old Testament scriptures, because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these who test that testify about me. Uh, and then, he, of course, goes on to put the hammer down on the Jewish audience because he says, you keep reading those scriptures, but you're stumbling over the person that they prophesied, namely Jesus. And the reason why they keep stumbling, he says in verse 42, you don't love God, but they love themselves. Verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another? You're too busy patting one another on the back to see the truth. You know, you need to prioritize your life and put God before everyone and everything. And so he'll, he'll again emphasize the importance of the scriptures. Keep searching to make sure you're looking for the truth without prejudice or bias. It's a hard thing to do 100% of the time, objectively. But look at all the witnesses that Jesus lays before us here to prove he is the Christ. No wonder what Jesus said to Peter when he said, you're the Christ. He said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, Flesh and blood hath not revealed this to me, but my Father who is in heaven. Through the prophets, through John's testimony, through the miracles, through what Jesus had said and done, and the unity of the scriptures, Peter and all the apostles had accepted that evidence that God supplied. They 
but he is the Christ, the Son of God. And so do we. Go back with me now to uh, Matthew. So we have the scriptures, we have all these witnesses. Remember, if you have two or three, we've got far more than two or three. In uh, verse 24 of Matthew 1, Joseph awoke from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and called his name Jesus. Uh, so, until is a term of duration, which says a certain course of action was followed until something occurred, and then either the same course of action or a different course of action was followed. Is it the same course of action that was followed, kept her a virgin, or a different one? Different? Different in what way? There are brothers and sisters. Okay. Are, does Jesus have siblings? In Matthew, you can show that, can't you? So you stay in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. Chapter 13. In verse 54, he came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue. They were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Just a side note here. People say all these miracles they claimed while he was a child. People in his hometown didn't know about that. So I, I, I don't think so. Uh, verse 55, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? So how many brothers, how many sisters did he have? Four brothers. And at least two sisters, so at least six uh, siblings there. So um, in Mark chapter 6, so we, we, we looked at chapter 13, verse 55, and Mark chapter 6, and verse 3, uh, Mark will say pretty much the same thing. The reason, uh, you know, we, we emphasize this, and I do this as a side point, is because there is a doctrine known as the perpetual virginity of Mary. Okay, the perpetual virginity of Mary. And the reason for that doctrine is another doctrine, and that is the doctrine of original sin. Uh, there are a number of religions that teach that a man is born in sin. He inherits sin. When, when, when you have a doctrine, though, that that ends with another biblical teaching. What is what should that cause you to think about the doctrine you're holding to? If it dead ends with another biblical teaching, maybe there's something wrong with my doctrine, and I need to change my understanding. Well, uh, the idea that you're born in sin would be a real problem with Jesus, since he would inherit the sin of Mary. Okay. To just inherit and pass on to Mary. So, you know, you have a problem there. So, that, well, you know, uh, we have this idea of miraculous, you know, conception and uh, that Mary remained perpetual virgin. And uh, because if she doesn't remain perpetual virgin, then her other children would not, not be born in sin either. See, if she had other children, then they wouldn't be born in sin. So you got all these exceptions that are taking place. So, you know, insert a different doctrine, the doctrine of the immaculate, uh, I call it deception, um, because the Bible does not teach you born in sin. Sin is a choice we make at different times of our life. All of us are different. It's a choice according to James chapter 1, 14 through 16, lust, sin, death. And uh, the same would be true, of course, of Mary. The same would be true of her sons. It's a choice that they made. 
So uh, that, that's that's why this this idea of uh, perpetual virginity of Mary and the Bible does does not teach that she had children. And in fact, we've looked at these passages here. What does the Bible teach about the right of a husband and wife in marriage? In fact, the duty of a husband and wife in marriage. What does the Bible say? In 1 Corinthians 7. What does the Bible say in 1 Corinthians 7 about the duty of the husband and wife in marriage? We'll look over there real quickly, and uh, then we'll get back to our main flow of, of teaching here. 1 Corinthians 7. And uh, verse 1, now concerning the things about which you wrote, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you. One of the lawful privileges, responsibilities in marriage, of course, is intimacy between husband and wife. That's the only place where intimacy is to be carried out is within marriage. We ought to put a fence around sexual relations, and that is defense of marriage. Anything outside of that is fornication, and that is condemned in the Bible. But within marriage, it's decent, it's pure, it's wholesome. And uh, God said, let the marriage bed, that is that intimacy between the husband and wife, be undefiled. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. Hebrews 13 and verse 4. So they're married. They have a right to do what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and fulfill their duty to one another. In fact, as I see it, they would not be in keeping with God's word if they didn't do that. Okay, that's all on the side there because that, that's a doctrine that comes up a lot, the doctrine of original sin. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 10, uh, Matthew chapter 1, please. And uh, Matthew chapter 1, uh, he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and called his name Jesus. And so I, I believe based on scriptural teaching that, you know, a different course of, you know, this course of action was followed, kept her a virgin until and after the birth of Jesus. It wasn't the same course of action, but a different course, meaning intimacy, which God authorizes in his word. Uh, yeah, he teaches in marriage. Chapter 2. Now let's let's start there, if we may. Now, after Jesus was born at Bethlehem of Judea, notice how specific uh, Matthew states it, as the prophet does in Micah. In the days of Herod the king, Magi, some translations say wise men, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he? been born king of the Jews, we saw his star in the east and come to worship him. So what do you know about the Magi? What have you read about the Magi? Anybody? Anything? They have been astrologers. Okay, okay. You certainly get that impression from this, don't you, sister, that they're, they're observing the sky? Anything else? What have you learned about the Magi? The tradition is that there were three of them, but it doesn't say that. doesn't say how many, does it? There are three gifts mentioned, but it doesn't mean there were three people. Could have been nine people, and each one offered uh, the same thing. Any number of people. So it doesn't say how many. So tradition is even given the names uh, of all things. Uh, but the uh, Bible doesn't reveal that. So where are they coming from? In the east. So it's always in reference to Israel. So from Israel would be somewhere in the east. What was east of there? <laughs> A lot of things. Uh, typically, they're identified with Persia. Uh, Herodotus, the Greek historian Herodotus, who goes way back to the 5th century BC, 
He says they were some kind of Persian religious sect. The Persian religious sect. That's what Herodotus said. Um, and it's interesting to me that uh, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 20, and chapter 2, verse 2, uh, Daniel will use that Greek word in the Septuagint to talk about some of the members, of, we'll call them Nebuchadnezzar's cabinet, the people he surrounded with himself with, prognosticators, soothsayers, foretellers, fortune tellers. You know, uh, the Greek word will be used there. Uh, we get our English word magic, magician, or magi. Uh, different ideas about them. Don't know a whole lot, actually. We know they're from the East. Um, how did they how did they know that this particular star, where does the star come from? How did they know that it was about this person and the, the other details that we have? Look at verse 12 of chapter 2. Had God communicated, did God communicate with them at any point? Did God communicate with them? He certainly did when they were there. Yeah. It's possible so we, he could have before. We, we see, that's, that's, that's what I think too, brother. Uh, and so I'll just suggest, if God communicated with them in, after the fact, you know, which he does in chapter 2, verse 12, and they, he spoke to them in a, in a dream, they understood it was a message from God, and they obeyed the message from God, did they not? And they went back home a different way because of the threat of Herod. And so God communicated and understood us from God and they obeyed the voice of God. Could that not have been possible before as well? Um, I think so. Um, they saw a star and is it typical for a star to move and to be so low that you can actually tell the house over which it's directing? No, that, that's all supernatural, isn't it? I think it's all supernatural. This, this star had a specific purpose from God. It had a specific purpose. And there are a lot of things about these men and that purpose we may not understand, but what would be the main purpose? We always want to focus on that. What, why is this even in the story? What is the main purpose, especially when you think of, of Matthew writing to a Jewish audience? What does he want them to understand from the very beginning of this story of salvation? What does he want them to understand, brother? In this case, the fact that he's a king. That's the, that's the focus of this part of the story. He is a king, and they what have they come to do in regard to this king? They're not Jews, but they're still worship him. They came to worship him. Among those who were the very first to recognize Jesus as king and worship him as king were Jews or Gentiles? Gentiles. That's, that's a powerful message to this Jewish audience. This good news is for everybody. We've, we've seen that in the women that were mentioned in chapter one, and now we see it in the Magi who are coming from somewhere in the east. Uh, Herodotus thinks Persia. But uh, somewhere in the east, and they're there to worship the king of the Jews. And they do it. They worship him. They give homage. They bow before him and give him gifts fit for a king. And so whatever this king has to offer, it is for everybody, not just for the Jewish people. Um, anything else you want to, your thoughts, any other uh things you want to explore on that or think about. Um, let's go ahead and uh, go a little further here, if we may. Then verse 3 says, when Herod heard this, he was troubled. All Jerusalem with him. Why, why was all Jerusalem troubled? You know why Herod would be, because he was paranoid, right? He was a pathological man, paranoid for power. Okay? He had already, by this point, killed several members of his own family, yeah. including his sons, who he thought might have been trying to usurp his position. 
So if they hear a report, we come to see the king of the Jews, everybody in the palace is going to say, who's going to die this time? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I agree. They're, they're fearful because of him. They're fearful of what he will do. The repercussions of his pathological lust for power. And they're correctly so. Look what he does. Rightly so. Now, what poor people had to deal with the murder of their little baby? Rightly so, they were careful. Uh, that's just among the many, as Eddie points out, atrocities of this man. He was a wicked, wicked man. He's the first in a long line of Herodian rulers. Uh, actually, second, his father was a ruler. Um, he, he was from an Edomite family who came from Esau, so they had some understanding of the Jewish people, the Edomites, being from Esau. Um, and so his father had done a lot of things for Rome, and so he was given a rulership, and then the Herodian sons, grandsons, on down from there. And so that's, but it begins with Herod, the Herodian family. Herod is a title. It's a title, it just means hero. Uh, I would say loser, but uh, <laughs> hero or great one. And then when he dies, his kingdom will be split among his sons, uh, Philip, Antipas, and Archelaus. Archelaus will get the southern region of Judea and Antipas the northern area. And so that's why their name keeps coming up later on. But it's all part of a very, they're all chips off the old block, just like their dad. Um, wicked, wicked people. But Herod uh, is the first of the Herodian line there. Uh, so he, he knows, though, that the Jews, the certain, one, certain ones to go to to get the information about Jesus. And so verse 4, or about the Christ, he gathered uh, the chief priests and the scribes of the people and inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born, and they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, this is what's written by the prophet. So that'd be the second prophecy that Matthew would bring out here. But he goes to the Jewish leaders. You have your Sadducees. They were the political leaders, the aristocratic people. What did they control in the Jewish people? What were they power-hungry over? The Sadducees. What did they control? The priesthood. The priesthood and the temple. The temple. We call the priesthood of the temple. And then you've got your scribes, most of whom are Pharisees. And what do they control? And they lust for this power constantly over the synagogues. The synagogues. See why they hated Jesus so much? Because he spoke out against corruption of the temple, he spoke out against corruption in the synagogues, and they don't want to lose that power. So that's so the Sadducees controlled the temple and the Pharisees controlled the synagogues, and thus they controlled the people. And Jesus was taking the people away. Plus, they were very greedy. They were very greedy. And uh, many of them also sexually immoral. Uh, Matthew 5 28, they would lust. They wouldn't commit adultery, they said, but they would lust in their heart. And God says uh, that too is sinful. So uh, he goes to them, though, and they do identify the place. And so this is from Micah chapter 5. I want you to look over there. Micah doesn't uh, uh, finish as we've divided that verse there in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Uh, Matthew doesn't put the entire portion of verse 2 there, but I think it's an important part of that. So the first part of Micah 5, verse 2 says, You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means least among the leaders of Judah. Out of you will come forth a ruler, obviously not David, um, because he's been dead 300 years. A ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And then what does the rest of chapter 5, verse 2 say? What does it say? His goings forth are from... From long ago, from all eternity. So that's how the Jews identified this as messianic, from all eternity. It's more than a human lineage. It 
goes beyond human ancestry into eternity from all eternity. And so, you know, pretty easy to identify that as being beyond the humanity. Yeah, but it gives you where the king comes from. He comes from the capital city, the great city. That's true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. God takes everything we expect. And just, <laughs> says, no, nope, no, nope, you got it wrong. We, we, we would assume the king would come from Jerusalem, right? But he, no, from Bethlehem of Judea. Look how specific the prophet is. 700 plus years before the fact. Micah says that. Think about the detail. There are two Bethlehems, one in Zebulun and one in Judea. Micah says, no, it's the one in Judea. Maybe he could have missed that, but he didn't. I mean, how could he possibly know that? And they, they understood this was a prophecy of the Christ. If somebody was asked me, let's, let's think of an illustration here. Um, I'll choose my... Uh, our oldest son, Ryan, is a year before he was born. <coughs> if they said, uh, Dempsey, where will Ryan be born? I would have had to say, well, if God blesses us with children, then, you know, living in St. Joseph, Missouri, he will probably be in Missouri, he'll be born in Missouri. Wrong. That's just a year out. Because within a few months, we moved to Boca Raton, Florida. And Ryan, and Dana were born in Boynton Beach, Florida, Long Beach County. We came up out of Indiana, and Ryan is called in Missouri. But you see, he was born in Florida, came up out of Indiana, and called in Missouri. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, came up out of Egypt, like Israel, and called what? Nazarene. The Nazarene. Nobody could possibly know that but the Holy Spirit. The Bible is very specific, which uh, helps us to see this is this is truly credible. It's credible. Without prophecy books claim, claiming inspiration, no credibility. The Bible has hundreds of prophecies like that. Um, let's go a little further, if we may, here in verse. Uh, Seven of chapter two. Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. He determined the age of the baby. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me so that I may come and worship him. He didn't send soldiers that would probably raise too much suspicion. But just come back to me and then I will worship the child. So the Magi see. King where they worship. Herod sees a threat, a threat worthy of death, such as his evil lust for power. Verse 9 After hearing the king, they went their way. The star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was, evidently low enough to pinpoint the exact location. It's a singular star used by God for a special purpose. And uh, when they saw the star, look at the uh, hyperbole here, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And you definitely get the sense that they were almost beside themselves. You know, they just couldn't be still. This is such a happy occasion that uh, here it is, and it, it brings us to the place where he is. And uh, it's you can see them almost being animated about it. You know, they're so happy about it. Yeah. yeah. They, they traveled a pretty dark, pretty far yeah, distance, yeah, a pretty true. long trip to get here. Yeah. It's not like they came from across town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, this very long journey, they finally got to what they want to see. Yeah. A yeah. week from today, we're gonna go see our grandson. I can tell you how excited I'm gonna be when I pull in the driveway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I, I totally identify. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. They a lot of time, effort. They couldn't get into their Honda Accord and get a drive. You know, this is very slow going here with these gifts, and uh, they don't really 
probably have never been here before, and so they don't know, you know, where they're going to be going, how long it's going to take, and here is the answer. Of course, the main thing is to see this this new king, to see this king. That's what they understand him to be, king of the Jews. And to actually have that opportunity to see him uh, at this stage of his life and be among the first to worship him. What a privilege. Can hardly contain himself. And so verse 11, after coming into the, not stable, to the house, right? It's, you know, several days or weeks have passed now. They saw the child with Mary. They only were in the stable because the inn was too crowded as soon as they could. Of course, they're going to go to the house, right? And, and they do so. So they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him, gave homage. They bowed before. The, the literal word means to kiss before, to kiss the feet or kiss before. And... Uh, you know, so such is the homage and the respect and reverence that's being paid to him. Typically, you would just bow to the ground before this person. And we bow our hearts to the Lord in worship, as we're doing now in Bible study. To God be the glory to any good that's said or done tonight. The, gold, the gifts gold, frankincense, and myrrh, gifts fit for a king. What uh, frankincense and myrrh, you have incense uh, from plants, costly, costly incense, aromatic uh, gifts, costly gold, spoken of in Genesis 2, much desired by men as early as Genesis 2. Um, what will these gifts help Joseph do in just a few days? God thinks of everything. Where are they going to have to go? Egypt. Have to go to Egypt. It's going to take money. It's going to take extra money than what they planned on. They just planned on registering for a census. Well, now they're going to be in Egypt for a while. I don't know how long. But it's going to take money. So the gold, frankincense, and myrrh help take care of that. God thinks of everything. Um, and so, uh, Verse 12, having been warned by God and agreed not to return to Mary, again, proves God had spoken to them. The, the Magi left for their own country and made their way. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Matthew is the only one that mentions in a dream, in a dream, in a dream, six times they say that. Uh, and the angel said, get up, take the child, his mother, and flee to Egypt. Remain there until I tell you. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Um, Alexander the Great opened the gates of Egypt uh, in the fourth century and uh, allowed many peoples to come in and settle a number of people in Egypt, especially Alexandria, Egypt, which he named after himself. So there were numerous colonies of Jews in Egypt, especially. Alexandria, Egypt. Remember, the Septuagint was written from Alexandria uh, by Jews, Greek translation of the Hebrew text, because they were forgetting the Hebrew uh, tongue. And so this was a neutral place for Jews. It would be a safe place and out of the control of Herod. So he couldn't touch them there. So uh, they go into Egypt, and there they will find refuge for the time. So verse 34, Joseph took the child and his mother while well, it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This is to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Very interesting statement there. Out of Egypt, I called my son. What prophet said that? Out of Egypt, I called my son. Hosea, go, go with me. Let's look at that prophecy. Hosea chapter 11. Israel had sown the wind, and God says in Hosea, you're going to reap the whirlwind. And uh, the northern tribes, in just a few years, 
2000 again, about the same time as Micah. In chapter 11, verse 1, God, though, is recalling a better time in Israel's history. And so he says, when Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So who, who's, who's the son here? Who's the son of Hosea? Nation of Israel. The nation of Israel. The nation of Israel. Um, together, they are the son of God. And he'll go on to say, verse 2, the more they called them, the more they went from them. And I think he saw that the prophets. God said, prophets, Israel rejected them. They kept sacrificing the Baals. But uh, I just want you to see here that God refers to Israel as his son. And that's significant. Okay. So you had Adam as God's firstborn son. And did, did Adam succeed or fail the Lord? He failed the Lord. God's firstborn son failed the Lord. And now you have Israel as a congregation viewed as God's son. And do they succeed or fail the Lord as his son? They fail the Lord as his son. Look at Exodus chapter 4, if you would, Exodus 4. <laughs> Some 700 years earlier. Verse 22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, this is Exodus 4, 22. You shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go, that he may serve me, but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So not only is Israel God's son, but Israel is God's firstborn son at this time. Now, what was the right of the firstborn? What was the right of the firstborn? Blessing the, the inheritance, double portion of the blessing and preeminence. Israel had preeminence from God, and Israel had multiple blessings that the other nations did not have. So she was treated very kindly, graciously as the firstborn. Look now at uh, Psalm 96. Psalm 96. As the firstborn, there were responsibilities. With privilege comes responsibility. With blessing comes responsibility. And uh, in Psalm 96, Israel has three responsibilities. And uh, verse 1, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. And so Israel has the responsibility as God's firstborn to declare God's glory to all men. Proclaim his excellency among all men. And the reason is given in verse 4. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. And then verses 7 through 9, Israel has a responsibility to invite all the nations to honor God. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Israel was to invite the nations to honor God. And then in number three, the third responsibility she had, verse 10, 
Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. So Israel was to warn all the nations of the judgment of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Serve the Lord. Remember, judgment is coming. Did Israel fulfill her responsibility as God's firstborn? No, Israel failed. And God eventually rejected them uh, strictly as a physical nation. They're welcome to come to God through Jesus, but as a physical nation, that special relationship is over. They failed. So Adam failed as God's firstborn. Israel failed as God's firstborn. What are you and I? Now, this is where I want to bring it all together, and then we'll have to call it a night. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's bring it all together here. Eddie's going to talk about this at length, I'm sure, and I look forward to that, brother. Hebrews 12, look at this. In verse 22, this is you, brother and sister, and myself, and all Christians. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of what? What are you now? And I, firstborn children, firstborn. Who are enrolled in heaven? Adam failed, Israel failed, Jesus, God's only begotten son, did not. And he gave us the right to become children of God. Yay, firstborn of God. It's now our responsibility to glorify God, invite all the nations to honor him, and remember, judgment is coming. That's our responsibility. Let's not fail as Israel did. Let's stop there. Thank you for studying with me tonight. And may God bless you. We'll end our class there. Really, really good study. Uh, <laughs>